Right Show. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. You can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash Show. All right, you guys, on the line, I've got the great Joe Loria. He is the editor of ConsortiumNews.com, and he's got such an important piece here. Assange hit with new superseding indictment. Spit. Reflecting possible FBI sting operation. Yeah, who would have thunk that? Welcome back to the show, Joe. How are you, sir? Thank you, Scott. I'm fine. Good to talk to you again. Yeah, uh, for those not familiar, the heroic Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, um, who has published uh, such great information over the years, already has been indicted. He's in custody in England, and but he's been indicted in the United States. Oh, over skipping bail on a fake charge. Um, but he's um, already indicted in the United States on Espionage Act charges. They're saying he's not a publisher like the New York Times, but he's a co-conspirator in getting the leak with then Bradley, now Chelsea Manning, back in 2010, the Iraq war logs, Guantanamo files, um, Afghan war logs, and uh, State Department cables there. And all of which are still available at WikiLeaks.org. And so this is already a huge problem, obviously, but now a superseding indictment, uh, which has all kinds of new accusations, but primarily, I think... You help me uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, Joe. It sounds like it's basically the same accusations again, that rather than being a publisher, he is a co-conspirator, this time with LulzSec and Anonymous, in pilfering certain documents from certain places. Please do tell. Yeah. Well, the most important thing to understand is there are no new charges in this superseding indictment. So there's a lot of window dressing. There's a lot of stuff that it's in there that is accusing him of this, that, and the other thing, none of which are against the law or that he's not been charged for. Just a quick example. They just threw in there that Assange helped Edward Snowden escape from Hong Kong. This is already well known. And that he used diversionary tactics, such as booking Snowden on several flights that he wasn't going on, except the one that they had hoped to get him on, uh, or they did get on, get him on from Hong Kong. And then they were trying to get him on to Latin America. He was not to stay in Moscow. Why is that in this indictment, uh, this superseding indictment? Because the purpose of this superseding indictment appears to be clearly to further smear Julian Assange. Right in there with the uh, false rape accusations. Three times Sweden dropped them. He was never charged with rape. Sweden would not come to London to interview him because of pressure from the British uh, Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, yet in many people's minds, mostly Democrats, he's a rapist, and they got he helped he helped uh, Trump defeat Clinton. So uh, this is more piling on against Assange. It comes after I don't know if this is linked. I really don't, but they probably had this thing waiting. But there's a movement growing in Australia where I am. Uh, there was a 60 Minutes program on here, 60 Minutes CBS, 60 Minutes. There's a Australian version of that. They interviewed. Assange's partner, Stella Morris, the mother of his two children, and it was an incredibly sympathetic and understanding and factual account of Assange's situation, very rare to see in the mainstream media. And the next day, the Melbourne City Council voted a resolution in favor of Assange, asking for him to be brought back to Australia. So this is an attempt to make Assange look to, look out, look to be as though he were a hacker, not a journalist. This is key to the government, U.S. government's strategy. Because if he's a journalist, if he did what the New York Times and the, the Spiegel and the Guardian did, which partnered with Assange on the very leaks and the very stories that are the subject of his first espionage indictment, then they'd have to indict the New York Times as well, and the Guardian and the Spiegel, because uh, Assange is not an American, he's on foreign soil, because the Espionage Act allows this universality of uh, prosecution. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that funny in right fact, there? That the, yeah. the Justice Department's idea is that, well, you know, if WikiLeaks gave stuff to the New York Times, the New York Times published it. Of course, that's protected. But well, <laughs> WikiLeaks well, publishing it, no, of course not, because they're a co-conspirator well, rather than a publisher. 
Well, exactly, because if he's not a journalist, then he's something else. Well, what is he then? Well, they're trying to make him out to be a hacker. Mm -hmm. And this is what this superseding indictment tries to reinforce, this idea that he worked with hackers. He didn't pay them to work for him, that he instructed them and directed him. It turns out two of these hackers were FBI informants, mm -hmm. which raises the possibility this was a sting operation all along, which led the interior minister of Iceland at the time to prevent plane load, I don't know how many, of FBI agents coming to Iceland to try to convince the Icelandic government to work with them on this sting against uh, Julian Assange. And because he'd worked in Iceland at the time and he kicked him out. The, 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 if the interior minister at the time that would not allow the FBI to enter the country because he suspected this was going on. Wow. This, of course, is not spelled out in this superseding indictment. What's spelled out is how Assange was speaking openly in various hacker conferences, saying this is what uh, WikiLeaks would like to have, and could you try to get it for us? Now, Robert Perry, who founded the website that I'm the editor-in-chief of right now, in December of 2010, wrote an incredibly prescient ar article mm -hmm. in which he said that every journalist is Julian Assange, because what exactly what Assange was doing is what he did. Now, Bob, of course, was one of the best investigative reporters of his generation, having broken the, some of the major uh, Iran-Contra stories, such as the identity of Oliver North and his role in that scandal. So Bob was saying that he often worked with sources who he encouraged to give more information, but also even to break the law if necessary, to leak something that could prevent a larger crime from being committed. And that one could say is what happened with the collateral murder video. Well, and especially, by Chelsea the way, Manning I mean, gave. to break the law in this case means to leak anything. I mean, every one of these government employees well, is bound right. by. Right. Yeah. Including the senior intelligence officials who leak stuff to the New York Times and the Washington Post. Right. But the point they're, being, he's when you say, too, right, when you when you're quoting Bob telling them to break the law, he's not saying to hurt anyone or commit any crimes. No. He's saying to break the law. The I mean, their NDA secrecy agreement signed. has the force of right. law because they're government employees right. and they could go to prison for exactly. leaking. And so that's what you're exactly. talking about there, just to be clear. Right. No, absolutely. Just to break their non-disclosure agreement that they had signed. Right. And also, um, in this case, maybe there are two crimes that are being committed because in Bob's case, it was just speaking to government officials to leak something which would have been the crime of giving an unauthorized disclosure. Mm -hmm. But in the Assange case, it's, it's also asking them to hack to get the material to then give to him. Right. So two crimes. But Assange is never accused of directly being involved in hacking. If you read the, this preceding indictment or the first indictment, which was for computer intrusion, carefully, he's not accused of really being a hacker. But of working with hackers, okay, that's journalism. As far as I'm concerned, as far as Bob Perry was concerned. So this uh, new superseding but, indictment for all this stuff saying, well, two points here. They're saying that essentially what they're accusing him of doing with Lulzsec and Anonymous here in cajoling them or whatever the term is, uh, working with them, uh, assigning them certain things to get or whatever, that level of cooperation that they're really not describing a level of cooperation that you would see as fundamentally different in any way than is already described about him working with Manning and asking Manning, right. I sure would like to get this or to get that. Is that right? And, and then the second well, thing is, was, and there's no new Manning charges here. The Lulzsec and the no. anonymous stuff don't, it's the same old charges. They're just essentially adding this on like, the 12 page report on RT on the intelligence report here just to make it look thicker. Yeah. It's window dressing, as John Kiriako called it. Um, just had the indictment, the Espionage Act indictment. It's got huge amounts of um, uh, paragraphs there about how he endangered the lives of informants. Now, it turns out that uh, Mark Davis, an Australian journalist who was there at the time in the bunker at The Guardian in London, when they were working on this, uh, he finally came out 10 years later, and that was only last year, to say that, in fact, it was the other way around, that the Guardian editors and New York Times didn't give really div give much of a damn about naming informants. But it was Assange that worked overnight from Friday into Saturday to, to purge as many names as he could before publication on Monday. Mm -hmm. Davis also pointed out that the New York Times tried to trick Assange, they were supposed to publish first, and then WikiLeaks was going to put the, their material on their own website. 
But in fact, the Times uh, held back and they were trying to get WikiLeaks to publish first because they were worried, you see. Then the Times could make it look like their own scoop, but at the same time, WikiLeaks had published it first. So I don't really know if this is true or not, but WikiLeaks suddenly had a technical problem and couldn't get it up on time. So the Times did publish first. But the issue is that I'm making here, the point I'm making here is that it is, as far as I know, I've not found any statute that makes it illegal to unmask the name of an informant of the government. Certainly from the Valerie Plam case, it's illegal to um, to uncover the name of a undercover CIA agent. But as far as informants go, there's no statute that is named in that indictment, the Espionage Act, that specifically applies to naming informants. It's all from the Espionage Act. And I have studied that Espionage Act, and there's nothing in there about uh, revealing names of informants. So let's say he didn't really actually name these informants or did something as much as he could to redact them. The whole oh, a good part of that first indictment is that he endangered lives. And then there was a study by Professor Robert, uh, General Robert Carr. They looked into it at the Pentagon. They spent a lot of money and time and they discovered zero people who had been killed because of the release of those documents. Right. And they admitted that at Manning's court martial. They did. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So that's window dressing, where you just pile stuff into there as a PR operation, which is what indictments often are when you don't really have solid evidence. And they don't have solid evidence. The only thing they've got, they have him on a technicality that he did, yes, possess and disseminate classified information, and he wasn't authorized to do it. But if I, if I or you or one of your listeners retweets or emails a WikiLeaks document to someone, and that's still considered classified by the government, they've also broken the Espionage Act. Right. That's how absurdly broad it is. So that's all they really got him on, and that's not really enough because that is could be challenged as unconstitutional. It and seems they've to never go gotten away with prosecuting that, even since no. the Wilson years, ever. Never tried. In, in Woodrow Wilson's time, they did prosecute journalists, but for trying to interfere with the draft, not about possession and dissemination. And FDR tried to do it, and then Nixon tried to do it. With, in the Pentagon Papers case, he actually impaneled a grand jury in Boston to go against the two New York Times reporters who'd written on the Pentagon Papers. But in the last minute, when it was discovered that, uh, that uh, Ellsberg's uh, office had been bugged and they had broken into a psychiatrist's office. The two reporters, uh, who Henrik Smith and Neil Sheehan, asked the government, oh, have we been bugged too? Since you bugged Ellsberg's phone, you probably heard us too. They dropped the case. Mm -hmm. So and Obama went right up to the line and decided we couldn't do it because we'd have to also indict the New York Times. Because they realized that this, this part of the Espionage Act that I just referred to about possession and dissemination mm -hmm. is so weak and goes up against the First Amendment that if challenged in a in a reasonable Supreme Court, it could be struck down as unconstitutional. Yeah. Well, but now and slow down on that last part. Yeah. Slow down on yeah. that last part there, Joe. I mean, that's really important that Barack Obama, who prosecuted more sources for journalists than any other president, all the other presidents combined under the Espionage Act, wanted right. badly to indict Assange. And his lawyers said, we just can't. Or then we'd have to indict James Risen who by now, yeah. because of his Russia trutherism, belongs in prison. <laughs> well, uh, he's certainly on the establishment side uh, in that regard, yes. But that's exactly right. The Obama administration wanted to, but could not. That's the context in which uh, uh, Bob Perry wrote the piece I referred to earlier, that he, he saw exactly what the government was trying to do. And he said, that's what journalists do. And they're trying to pretend that the other journalists, the mainstream journalists, are safe, but they really can't get away with it. Yeah. And that was before the Obama administration pulled back. And then they did. But here's the Trump administration and their famous war with the press. And and I think it's really not Trump at all. It's this is Mike Pompeo. His fingerprints are all over this. First speech he gave CIA director was to call WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence agency. And that's because Vault 7, the largest leak of CIA material, had just been released. And this is WikiLeaks. just so, absolutely, by the way, a completely made up, ridiculous thing that does not exist. It's not an intelligence agency if it's not an intelligence no. agency. <laughs> you know? Well, what's the difference between a reporter and an intelligence agent? Yeah, Both nothing. of them are seeking information, secret information. If the journalist gets it, he wants to make it public. If the agent, if, if an intelligence agent gets it, he's going to keep it secret for the state that he works for. That's the main difference. And they, of course, have much more means that journalists can employ to get information, bribery, yeah. blackmail, threats. Etc. And they could also the government could also subpoena people and reporters cannot. So that is exactly what why Assange is a journalist, because he made it public. Hey, guys, just real quick. If you listen to the interviews only feed, 
at the Institute or at scotthorton.org. I just want to make sure you know that I do a Q&A show from time to time at scotthorton.org slash show, the old whole show feed. And so if you like that kind of thing, check that out there. Hey guys, here's how to support this show. You can donate in various amounts at scotthorton.org slash donate. We've got some great kickbacks for you there. Shop Amazon.com by way of my link at scotthorton.org. Leave a good review for the show at iTunes and Stitcher. Tell a friend. I don't know. Oh, yeah. And buy my books, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and The Great Ron Paul, The Scott Horton Show Interviews 2004 through 2019. And thanks. Hey, guys. Check out Listen and Think audiobooks. They're at listenandthink.com and, of course, on audible.com. And they feature my book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, as well as brand new Out Inside Syria by our friend Reese Ehrlich and a lot of other great books, mostly by libertarians there. Uh, Reese might be one exception, but essentially they're all uh, libertarian audiobooks. And here's how you can get a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think audiobooks. Just donate $100 to The Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate. Now, so let me uh, try to nail something down here. For years, you were a reporter at the Wall Street Journal and I think, what, Christian Science Monitor too, right? No, Boston Globe. Oh, Boston Globe. I'm sorry. It's been a while. Um, but Wrong, uh, so And I know you wrote for the Boston. Times in London as well. And so, so I mean, can you yeah. tell us that specifically you have told government employee sources in meetings or on the phone, listen, yes, OB, get me that document. I want to see it. And therefore... You know, essentially in a way that makes you absolutely no different than what Assange is accused of doing here? I I cannot remember. Uh, I never worked. I worked as an investigative reporter for the Insight team at the Sunday Times of London. And I remember on working on a big 9-11 piece just months after 9-11. Uh, I don't remember specifically asking that, but I did speak to people who had classified stuff that may have given it to me. So, I mean, I don't remember saying to them, look, commit this crime, it doesn't matter. But I wasn't really the kind of investigative reporter Bob Perry was. And most, I covered the United Nations for 25 years. So I was, uh, and there's plenty of spooks over there, I could tell you that, in New York. But I did not, uh, I did not do it in that way. But Bob Perry was uniquely positioned to make this comment because he did do that. And he was able to speak from his own experience, having done it numerous times. And he was saying, this is what uh, Assange is doing. Whether you like the guy personally or not, you know, cares about his personality. He, he's he's doing what reporters have to do. And as Bob said at one point, the, the rules of the game were always traditional rule was the government hides things and the reporter tries to find them. That was the game. But we're in a different era now. We're in a really ugly time by this indictment amongst all the other things horrible things that are going on. But we've seen the government of the United States and with the collusion of the British government framing really and stitching up a reporter who was not a traditional reporter. The journalism has changed. This is internet journalism. And he didn't go to Columbia Journalism School. But believe me, you don't have to go to Columbia Journalism School to be a real good journalist. And he uh, published raw material, but there was analysis. And Assange uh, gave many interviews and wrote articles. He understood what he was reporting. With these documents, he, he's not some clerk who just got material and then put it out on the Internet. He understood the material and they vetted it all and it was all accurate. So he's certainly a different kind of journalist, but in many ways, a better journalist than a lot of the mainstream people. And as John Pilger's also often pointed out, there's a bit of jealousy here of reporters for mainstream papers who didn't get the scoops that Assange did. That's also an element here, right. I think. Well, not just that they didn't get the scoops, but that the information that he revealed showed them to be not journalists at all, but have wasted their lives being be nothing stooges. but minor birds for the state, particularly That's on right. Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, yeah, without question. And stooges for intelligence agencies to allow themselves to be used to launder disinformation um, through the mainstream press. If Public is more likely to believe something if it's reported in the New York Times and if the CIA says it directly. So it, it's a disgusting role that the mainstream and national security reporters in general play. And Assange couldn't stand these people. And that was one of the reasons why there was such personal conflict between the reporters, especially at The Guardian and the editors at The Guardian and Assange, because he, he didn't have a lot of respect for them. But he knew he needed the big media to amplify what he had uh, found, what he had gotten, what people had given him. 
And don't forget, Chelsea Manning went first to the Washington Post and the New York Times with her leaks, and they never returned her calls. Right. So and Politico, too. She went to WikiLeaks and Politico. Right. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yep. Totally ignored her. And imagine that, too. You're the New York Times, and you got to army somebody going, man, I got the mother load of secret level documents for you about all the wars. And you just say, no, that's not the business we're in here at the New York Times. Yeah, and then Sorry. they wound up having to partner with WikiLeaks to publish it. And I think they right. resented that. And so by the way, downplay him. Yeah, let, let me just say real quick, if people uh, just notice, if you search search for the phrase, uh, as revealed by WikiLeaks documents or as shown in the State Department cables or something like that, and especially if you add Iraq and Afghan war logs to your searches, you'll see there are probably 10,000 news stories that have come out of those documents uh, so far. Absolutely. Or at least, you know, one detail on a news story that, well, it is confirmed in the WikiLeaks that back in 09, et cetera, et cetera. And just this has been the absolute mother load for good journalism, truth that the American people and the people of the world, as Manning said then, deserve to know. Simple as that. But now I got to give you the last word about Assange's situation locked in a cage like an animal in Great Britain. Yeah, his extradition hearing has the resumption of it has been put off till September 7th because of the, the virus. Uh, they don't have a courtroom yet. Exactly. It won't be in London. Uh, and it's going to go on for three weeks. And that's when it's going to probably be determined whether Britain extradites him or not. There's been a huge effort. 216 doctors have just sent a letter to the uh, Secretary of State for Justice in, the, in Britain and published a letter in The Lancet, the premier British medical journal, saying that he needs to be released. He's in danger of uh, not only COVID, but his other underlying uh, problems uh, physically that he's had for years, including a lung ailment. So there's pressure building, but when it comes down to it, you have to be very optimistic to think that they won't find a way to extradite Julian Assange to Alexandria, Virginia, in the end of the day. The, the great argument that, the, the, that his defense team has is that the uh, treaty between Britain and the United States says that no one could be extradited for a political offense. This is clearly a political offense. They could demonstrate that in numerous ways. But there was also an act that took place, uh, the British Extradition Act that came out uh, before that, that does not, says nothing about political uh, crime. So the prosecution is trying to rely on the act, the defense on the treaty, and um, let's hope that they make the right decision. But the kind of pressure the United States is bringing to bear on Britain and the British intelligence services have their own interests in getting Assange as well. So this is revenge against a guy who did really good journalism to expose corruption and criminality of the state. But of course, it's only the enemy states of the U.S. that commit these things. We're the good guys. I mean, this is what he's challenging, Assange. That we aren't the good guys. And I think people are waking up to a lot of stuff. The public, if they were given the story by the main media, the mainstream media would be on his side. But they aren't. It's distorted because the mainstream media is in the service of the establishment and of the state, as you pointed out. So hopefully um, we'll see something coming out in September that might be good. It'll be a, a great presentation, I think, by the defense. But we have to um, think that he probably will be extradited to the U.S., but one never knows. Yeah. Well, it'll be a great test for uh, whether there's such a thing as the rule of law in England or just the rule yeah. of men and their politics and their will, like usual. Exactly. A, a great test case for that, and I'm certainly very pessimistic. But then again, I actually think there's half a chance that if he, if he was, well, if he is extradited, he'll almost certainly be convicted in Virginia. But then yeah, I got half a mind that the Supreme Court would spring him loose anyway at the end of the day. But, it, you know, if he didn't die in prison by then. Well, if they could get that part of the Espionage Act overturned as unconstitutional, there's a chance, there's also a chance if he got a jury trial, but he probably won't get a jury trial, that they can nullify this, realizing yeah. that this is uh, not, uh, 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 this law is not constitutional itself. Well, if he gets do. a jury trial, it'll be all government employees in Alexandria well, that's anyway. The so that's the problem, yeah. exactly. Um, all right. And now I'm sorry. Uh, give us one more word about Chelsea Manning, too, because um, uh, she yeah. was sitting in jail for a year on contempt for refusing to testify against Assange and was only just recently released a couple of months ago after attempting suicide again. So I was wondering if you yeah. know the latest on how Manning is doing here. No, I don't. I, I don't. But I do know that they didn't rely on her testimony because she didn't give any for this superseding indictment. There was a lot of speculation. Why do they were holding her? Was there going to be another indictment coming out? And there is, but there's no new charges, as we said. So she's free. And I want to point out that it was, I was just extra vengeance and punishment there is all it was, huh? 
Oh, that was definitely part of that, I think, no question, because a lot of people, Republicans in particular, were upset with Obama for commuting her sentence. But I, I was in the courtroom in the, the Woolwich Crown Court, which is on the campus of the Belmarsh Prison, for one of the days of uh, testimony. And the lawyers for Assange pointed out something extraordinary, that the indictment, the first indictment, which is repeated in this one, by the way, exactly word for word, because most of this superseding indictment is just a repeat of the uh, of the existing indictments, said that Assange had uh, helped her break a cra- a password to get into a government computer. Now, first of all, it does say in that indictment that she had legal access to that computer. So it was only to get her to get an administrative password to hide her identity, which is nothing Bob Paris said he did all the time. Because you, of course, you have to help hide the identity of your of your anonymous sources. That I've had a lot of experiences with. But it turned out that the lawyers claim, and I don't think they would in open court if it weren't if they didn't have anything to back it up with, that Assange was helping her break this break get into this. Uh, computer under an administrator's name, so she could download music videos and computer games. Why? Because they're forbidden for U.S. personnel serving to have. You're not allowed to download music videos and video games. So that's all she was doing. It's absurd. Didn't get a lot of attention. But that's repeated again. I mean, this is what he was supposed to be doing, breaking the law by helping her yeah, get a password uh, that uh, get, get into an administrative uh, under an administrator's name. This is a very weak indictment. This doesn't do anything, but it does feed those people who are already predisposed against Assange to make him look like a dirty hacker, not a journalist. And he undermined the security of the United States. He actually undermined the security of the careers of people in the Pentagon and in the intelligence services and in the White House and Congress who supported these ugly wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that's why they got to get them. Yep. All right. Well, listen, man, I'm sorry. I got to let you go here because I got more questions, but we'll do it again soon and catch up. Okay. Maybe we'll have some good news to report someday here. Hopefully. Hopefully All right. Thank you very much uh, for your time, Joe. Appreciate it. All right, you guys, that is the great Joe Loria. He is the editor in chief at consortiumnews.com. And go read this important piece, Assange Extradition. Assange hit with new superseding indictment reflecting possible FBI sting operation. We didn't focus so much on that angle in this interview, but it's in there. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA. APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.